to welcome all of His Glory Nation as we continue our series in the book of Joshua. Tonight we'll be in Joshua 17. Again, it's going to go through some of the, um, uh, the passing out of the land, specifically in 17. I'll be talking more about Manasseh and Ephraim and Joseph. Again, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of Joseph. They were blessed by Jacob uh, when he went into, uh, down to Egypt. And they all will have an inheritance, and it was a pretty big inheritance. So most of this is going to do with the inheritance. But we're also going to talk about something uh, that gets passed over a lot in Scripture. It's called the Daughters of Zelophehad, and we'll explain how in detail that Moses was given this. Uh, uh, given this, there was five daughters. Five is always the number of grace, and it's pointing to the Christ, Jesus Christ, and how in the genealogies in Matthew and the genealogies in Luke, how God literally fulfilled the Messiah through this clause of the daughters of Zelophehad, and we'll go into that in detail and give you a brief uh, description and why Matthew and Luke's genealogies are different. It was for two purposes, and we'll explain that when we get there. The rest we'll just go through and just tell you, uh, you know, what the inheritance is. So we start Joshua 17.1. And before we do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west and north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is Christ the Lord. Again, when we get to the daughters of Zelophehad, this should open up a lot of the Old Testament and see how um, Joshua and Moses were pointing to the Messiah. Again, five daughters, grace in Zelophehad. There was also a lot, a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Jews, Joseph, namely from Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore, he was given Gilead and Bashan. Bashan, again, is the Golan Heights area, which uh, continues to have uh, demonic activity. That was where uh, Legion was. That's where Jesus was talking about the bulls of Bashan gather around me when he was on the cross, quoting King David. Uh, again, Bashan was an area of the Gigantes, uh, lots of giants in that area, and we're going to see Joshua referencing the Gigantes again here in a minute. And there was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh, according to the families, for the children of Abizar, the children of Helek, the children of Azrael, the children of Shechem, the children of Hefer, the children of Shemida. These were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, according to their families. But Zelophehad, the son of Hephor, the son of Gilead, the son of Machor, the son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mela, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza, five, meaning grace. So let's stop and talk about this. Uh, let me go read through four, and then we'll come back and explain this. And they came near before Eleazar the priest, before Joshua the son of Nun, uh, and before the rulers, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandments of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. Okay, so in the Torah, something in a, in, interesting happens. Um, the daughters of Zolo, the Zolophephad um, did not have a son. And under the, under the law, that the land could only be redeemed by the son. And so the five daughters came up to Moses and said, hey, our father doesn't have a son and you're allocating the land. And we, we should have rights to the, the land through our father and we have no brother to redeem it. And Moses was, well, Moses was stumped. He didn't know what to say. So he went and what we all should do in a time of being stumped, take it to the Lord. So he took it to the Most High God, and God said, give him the land. So he made an, God made an exception. It's called the, the exception of the, for the daughters of Zelophehad. And here they are coming back later under Joshua, when Joshua's inheriting, giving out the land after they um, conquered the, the, most of the Canaanite area for God's uh, everlasting promise for the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, they said, hey, remember what Moses said. And he, they went to the priest, uh, Eleazar, in exactly the way God, uh, Moses said it, and they honored it. So here's the interesting thing. The, being a daughter of the Zelophehad means that you had legal right to the land. Okay, so it could come through the, the daughters uh, and, and not having a son. So why does that matter? Matthew has one genealogy and Luke has a different genealogy. And there's two reasons for that. One has the line going through Mary, and we know Mary's father uh, did not have a son. So it falls under the Zelophehad clause. So that her land 
could be redeemed even though she did not or her father did not have a son so she being a woman could uh, could inherit the land and Christ was going to be the, the 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 line through David in that one line and then Joseph became his father or became um uh, the father-in-law and son-in-law and became Jesus is uh, adopted father. So the legal line came through Joseph, the bloodline and the, the redemption of the land because of the clause of Zelophehad came through Mary because Mary's father did not have a son. Um, so that shows you why the genealogies were different between Luke and Matthew. Um, God is just so perfect in all things. And there was another reason why. If you look at the difference between Matthew and Luke, one has, after King David, one has Solomon, which then created the lines, and one had Nathan. Why was there a difference? Because it was in Jeremiah that God got so upset with Jehoiakim that he put a blood curse on his line and said, nobody from your line will sit on my, my throne anymore. And that probably got Satan and all his demonic people, to, to, to all his demonic buddies to do an uptake and say, what did the Lord just say? Because the Lord's word is truth. Did he just make a mistake? He just cursed the bloodline of Jehoiakim. So that means the Messiah cannot come through the bloodline because that line was cursed. And God being as just perfect he always is, you can see that under Solomon and on Solomon's line, goes through Jehoiakim. So that was the blood curse. So no, a, a king could not come through that. But through the other genealogy, goes through Nathan. So God was able to avoid the blood curse that the Messiah came through because of Mary, the bloodline. And Christ, Jesus, will continue to be the scepter of Shiloh forever. Remember in Genesis, uh, jo, uh, um, um, Jacob gave a prophecy to Judah. And the scepter shall not leave Judah until Shiloh comes. I mean, the scepter, kingship, power will not leave until Shiloh. Shiloh was another name of the Messiah until the Messiah comes. And it was in 6 AD that the Roman government took away the power of um, capital punishment away from the Sanhedrin. And they, 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 they tore their clothes in sackcloth and ashes because they thought God lied in Genesis, saying, we don't have capital punishment anymore. We don't have a king anymore. And the Messiah has not come. God has lied. Little did they know, up north was in, in Nazareth was a, a little boy, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he came to fulfill it literally. So that's why the difference between the two genealogies. That's why God puts these genealogies in there. Little nuggets on how perfect and, and how Satan has always put roadblocks to try to stop the Lord from accomplishing his, his perfect plan. And God always has a way around it. He sees the beginning and the end, and our God is incredibly great. So that is uh, the purpose of the daughters of Zelophehad, how it's important in the Torah, how it's important in Joshua, and how it's extremely important with the Messiah and all the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. God is precise. Ten shares... Um, fell to Manasseh besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of the Jordan, because of the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons, and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. And the territory of Manasseh was from Asher to Mechbebeth, and it lies east of Shechem, and the border was along the south in the inhabitants of Entepah. Manasseh had the land of, uh, of Tepa, but Tepa on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. And the border descended to, to Brook Kenna, southward to the brook. These cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was on the north side of the brook, and it ended at the sea. South, southward it was Ephraim's, northward it was Manasseh's, and the sea was its border. Manasseh's territory was adjoining Asher at the north and Ash and Issachar at the east. Uh, so there's a map of this to the Mediterranean Sea, which the head of the crown of Joseph is the area of the Valley of Megiddo. Asher's foot is literally uh, dipping the, at the crown. You have Ephraim and Manasseh, a good chunk of land in that particular area. Again, we mentioned before that there's a prophetic that uh, the, there's oil in that area, and a company called Zion Oil and Gas is literally going to be drilling on the crown of Joseph, which... Ja yeah, um, uh, yeah, Asher's foot dips and dips into, and uh, the treasures of the sea, and then literally in the area of the Valley of Megiddo. 
So look for that. I believe they're drilling uh, in the fall of this year. And the, and the inhabitants of Endor and its towns, and the inhabitants of Tagnac and its towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns, three hilly regions. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. So they couldn't dwell out, get all the Canaanites out. Um, and it happened when the children of Israel grew strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. So they were able to conquer them and put them to forced labor, even though there was still potentially some gigantes still there. Um, but the lords uh, had, had uh, control over that. Um, going back to the, 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 the Valley of Megiddo and the, the head of Joseph and the, the prophecy about oil being there, it's my conjecture that in the book of Revelation, why the kings of the east and the Antichrist uh, uh, come up on all sides of Jerusalem uh, and Israel, and they gather in the Valley of Megiddo, is because of the oil. Uh, oil is the lifeblood of any economy, and the world needs oil, and especially in the kings of the east, China. Uh, China and India, 1.3 billion and 1.2 billion people uh, have a strong thirst for oil. They need it to keep their economies going, and that explains why they would come up upon Israel, because it's my belief that this prophecy is truth, that Israel will strike the mother load and change the power of the Middle East, and maybe the, the, one of the reasons why the Antichrist will be able to do a false peace and build the third temple before the tribulation. So Joshua answered them, if you are great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself. There's land and the parasites and the giants. Again, this area that they're complaining, we didn't get enough. They said, you're a great people. You guys go up with Ephraim and, and, and Manasseh and you go to this wooded country and, and you move out the parasites and, and the gigantes. Again, another reference to the Nephilim or the Arafafim or the gigantes or the Anakim. It's, uh, I think, mentioned 35 times in Scripture. We hear so many times, because unfortunately, nine and a half out of ten pastors will teach you the Seth theory. And the Seth theory is just, it's, it's a theological bunk. Um, that, you know, everything through the line of Seth was God's holy, and the, uh, everything through everything else was not, and, and that's why God created the flood. No, it, it, you read it specifically. Um, the, the watchers came down, they mated with uh, fair women uh, and created an offspring, which is called the, uh, uh, the Nephilim. And then the Rephaphim are part of that. The Anakim are part of that. Uh, there was Gigantes, and they were a demonic offspring of the watchers of the fallen angels. They did create a race. And that's why we see in Genesis, if we read it in the Hebrew really specifically, it says Noah was perfect in his generation didn't mean he was perfect without sin. It means his DNA had not been contaminated by the Watchers or the Nephilim. And if you get into the book of Yasser and the book of Enoch, even though it's not canon, the, the Bible does reference both of those, uh, those books. You can clearly see that there was a DNA problem of the Nephilim. And uh, it was uh, very important to understand that this is truth because it's, it's, Scripture says it will happen again. It's happening in a good time of jo Joshua, and it will happen again in the end times. And I uh, will spend not spend a lot of time here, but it's already starting to, to do that. Not only were they contaminating uh, with men and uh, you know fallen angels and women, but they were also doing it with animals. That's where you get the Greek and the Roman mythology of these half-men, half men, half have uh, God type creatures. Well, it was literal. It literally happened. Satan used that seed, and we always forget the second part of Genesis three fifteen. It says the seed of the woman. Well, the seed of the woman is referencing Mary and the virgin birth of Christ, because that's that is, that is uh, biologically incorrect. The seed is with a man, so that shows you the virgin birth, and it also says the seed of the serpent. So the serpent used his seed for something as well, and we always skip that part. The serpent used his seed to create this Nephilim, this Rephaphim, this Anakim, these giants to try to knock out God's plan. But God overcame and always will overcome through the blood of Jesus Christ. But the children of Joseph, the mountain country, is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. But those who are in Beth Shean and the towns of those who are in the valley of Jezreel, which is another area of, called the valley of Megiddo. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people, have great power. You shall not have only one lot. And there was some special extra power to Ephraim and Manasseh 
uh, that you can pick up in the book of, of, of Yasser, that God gave them supernatural uh, strength. And, uh, you know, there's some debate. Did they, get, did they literally have supernatural uh, um, strength similar to, what, um, similar to what Samson had in the book of Judges? Uh, or was it God supernaturally working through them, through them to give them power? Either or, probably both. It doesn't matter. The point is God was with them and they were strong. And because of God, not man, because of God and their faith in God, were, were able to overcome the chariots of iron and overcome the fallen demonic Nephilim and Anakim and Rephaphim. And we close out in verse 18. But the mountain country shall be yours, although it is wooded, you shall cut it down, at its farthest extent shall be yours, for you shall drive out, out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong, because they were part of the Gigantes. Again, we pray that Joshua 17 has been a blessing to you, and may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you today and always. God bless.